Okay, it is three o'clock. We have a quorum for the Bicycle Pedestrian Subcommittee of Transportation and Parking. So we're going to go ahead and start with the May 8th meeting. Welcome, everyone. We always start with, uh, I just want to announce that this is recording. I think, yes, it is recording. <laughs> um, and we always start the meeting with um public comment. I just want to um, note the members who are here. Um, although I don't see Donna, I guess she maybe had some difficulties and popped off, but um, Donna, oh, there she is. <laughs> um, Maggie Freeman, Devin, James uh, Lowenthal is in person and myself are in person. So we have a quorum. And so I'm going to go ahead and start. Does anyone have any comments on items that are not on the posted agenda? I have comments that are asking. Okay, yes. Go ahead. So Claudia Lefko, 40 Valley Street. I have two comments. One is, is about trying to form a pedestrian or a walking committee for the city. Um, I know Cambridge had such a thing, and I've come here before to say that I'm interested in putting more emphasis on pedestrian issues. Um, and I don't know how you consider that or not, but I'd be willing to volunteer myself as part of the committee and recruit people who would essentially help the city assess walkability. I know there's already mass walkability. There's whatever, they come and they do this. But anyway, that's one issue. And my second issue has to do with the sidewalk on Williams Street, specifically around 107 Williams. And I don't know what this committee has to do or not to do with priorities. And I know that there is there are priorities in place for where sidewalks get constructed. And so I'm asking on some level, how do we reconsider those? Be and I'm just going to try very quickly to say, you know, at 107 William Street, uh, there is there is a lot of walking traffic there. There is a new development there that's going to make walking more difficult. It is a heavily walked area for people who want to do a loop around the dike there by the fairgrounds. It's also, there's a large daycare program in the area and there's the lumber yard. And the lumber yard is built for, first of all, families. Uh, there are apartments for families, and it also accommodates people with uh, with otherly, you know, function people, uh, mobility issues and whatever. And there was a serious problem with one person who was blind, Deidre Muccio, who fell numbers of times walking from the lumber yard to Montview. So my question is when there is like a crisis, I mean, there are a number of people in the lumber yard, including Emma, who's on the disabilities committee, who are in wheelchairs, who have, who try to get around the neighborhood. It's, it's a little bit, I, I don't say it's a crisis, but it, it's, it's a, problem area and how does the city deal with that like if there were many accidents we would get immediate attention but i'm trying to see if there's some way this committee could weigh in on what on how you could be could help us navigate uh something that would be safer i don't know what your role is in terms of advocating for whatever but that's what i'm here to say so thanks Thanks, Claudia. Uh, does anybody else have any public comments? Um, thank you. Okay, just to note that, um, you know, public comment is um, are for any comments for anybody who wants to speak about something not on the agenda, but we don't you know, respond to public comments because they're not on the agenda. We can certainly talk about them at future agendas. So let's move ahead to the first agenda item. I don't see anybody else for public comment. So great. Um, I think the first item up was um, uh, Northampton High School design status. So Donna, do you want to talk about the difficult, not the difficult, the challenging issues relative to that project design? Um, 
Sure. I'm not sure. Is my audio working? We can't hear you. Yeah, I'm going to have to. I'm going to call. Okay. You. You're going to call on the phone? <laughs> Great. I'll let you in. <laughs> did you not get your um, Zoom updated by IT? I did. It, they didn't update it. No. <laughs> um, hold on. A so we, we can hear. I, I'm online and, and I can hear. Donna. Oh, nobody's. Uh -oh. What? I'm sure it's, it could be on our end. Could be. Hold on. Oh, well, that's good that you can hear me. Might be, a, might be a problem on our end. Okay. Um, that Yeah, that's going to be weird if I end up calling in and yeah. then like we're going to have a we're weird echo. We're good, we're good. That was my fault. You're good. <laughs> okay, here I was blaming IT. And, uh, I, I guess I, we, we didn't hear you. We didn't hear anything of you blaming IT. <laughs> okay, all right, that's great. Um, okay, yeah, so let's talk uh, briefly about the high school. So um, we have some uh, concept designs from Fuss and O'Neill, um, and part of that concept design is we want to install bike lanes on both sides of Route 9 um, by the high school and also on Elm Street, so going down that hill um, towards, you know, Riverside and Milton. So the challenge for us is, I, I mean, we certainly install anything. Um, the challenge for us is driver behavior. So I, what we have is a scenario where people are, are queuing up um, along Route 9 on both sides, and they're also queuing up on Elm Street um, at pickup and drop off time. And that is like a very entrenched behavioral issue. And so to, you know, I've sort of engaged with the school administration um, over time. And basically what I find to be most effective is like putting concrete barriers in the middle of the road. And that discourages people from queuing because there's no place for them to queue. So those concrete barriers are, are very, very effective. Um, but when we think about how we're gonna design this long-term, I have to think about how I'm going to maintain it. So those separated bike lanes are sort of the gold standard and everybody loves them from a maintenance standpoint, you know, with this being New England, I do have to think about weather. So putting in separated bike lanes is very, very difficult from a maintenance standpoint. Um, even if I could think about a scenario where I put in um, separated bike lanes that have like removable stanchions on them, um, you know, I still have to be able to sweep the street. Um, I have to be able to get like debris out of the gutter easily. So we have to just think about like long term, how am I maintaining this? So the best case scenario is that we have well painted, well marked bike lanes on both Route 9 and on Elm Street that cars are not driving in. That's sort of our best case scenario because people don't want to drive in them or park in them. Um, so you know, we're also going to take a closer look at if I could put in removable bollards that, you know, I could sort of pull out in November um, and reinstall, you know, at the end of March um, that, that would sort of give us seasonal protection, um, but allow us to maintain the road in the wintertime and then sweep it um, in the spring. Um, but we did have a call with the school administration yesterday to kind of talk about behavioral patterns that are causing people to queue in the street um, and therefore potentially conflict with these bike lanes. Um, and basically, we have two problems at the high school. The first is traffic flow in the parking lot um, is, is just, it can best be described as chaos. Um, so it, it is, um, if you've ever spent any time there at pick up or drop off, you've got a lot of vehicles trying to circulate through a poorly marked area that's, that's sort of not laid out in a way that is, um, the best use of the space. Um, and, and it's just kind of chaos. You've got the cars coming from every direction, buses coming from every direction, everyone sort of nose to nose and it's like, who's gonna back up first? So people are trying to avoid the chaos in the parking lot by queuing up on the street where the bike lanes would be. That's the first problem. The second problem is that there is need for accessible parking spaces 
um, for the high school. And right now, um, the accessible parking spaces that are sort of down um, where the main entry is um, in that lower lot, it's very difficult for folks in wheelchairs to navigate up that steep sidewalk on Elm Street. So kind of by default, um, not through any um, formal process, there are five parking spaces up on Route 9 headed inbound that are being used as sort of accessible parking spaces um, for people who can't traverse that sidewalk because it's too steep or whatever the challenge might be. Um, they're not labeled as accessible parking spaces, but that's how they're being used. So those are the two challenges that we see in the implementation of bike lanes as I described. And so both of these vexing problems um, are going to need to have some level of resolution before we can feel comfortable implementing the bike lanes as we have designed them. Um, because as much as we want to think we can control driver behavior without a physical thing in the middle of the street stopping someone from driving and or parking and or, you know, live parking to pick up their child at the high school is, um, is going to be very difficult. So that's where we are with the project. Um, again, we had a call yesterday with school administrators to just sort of talk about what their pain points are. Um, but we acknowledge that we have to do something to try to improve traffic flow within that parking lot and head it out onto Milton and Ormond and Riverside and that entire area to try to relieve that so that we can free up space in the bike lane to feel comfortable that, you know, it's not going to be blocked by queuing cars. Because as much as you want to put out a newsletter that says, like, please don't stop here or you know, please avoid this. Like we know what the reality of, of life is. Um, so that's an update on that project. If that's helpful, I don't know if there's any comments on that, but um, that's where we're at. Go ahead, James. Uh, thank you, Donna, for um, all the work uh, in responding to uh, uh, the tragedies and, um, and collisions in the past couple of years there. Uh, that of course add on years before that, and uh, we all know that it's there's no silver bullet for it. Um, I do. Uh, I, I am happy to hear that uh, protected bike lanes are being considered, and um, I'm generally in favor of them if they're well designed. And um, at the same time, I I hear your uh, your hesitation because of the maintenance issue, and um, I do think that in general that's something that this committee should take a deeper dive into and weigh in on uh, as a matter of city policy, not just at the high school, but in general, um, how we feel, uh, 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 you know, what what's the sort of uh, default uh, protected bike lane uh, approach. I am concerned about pulling out bike lanes for the winter, which then, um, especially when there isn't snow on the ground, makes the road wide again and invites speeding. And, it will, it will be right back to where we are now with regard to pedestrian safety and pedestrians crossing in the crosswalk. I understand that the Fuss and O'Neill plan also includes um, additional measures, but uh, the width of the road is one of the primary ones. And I would really advocate us to, to consider a plan that permanently narrows the road because that has been shown in study after study to significantly lower the speed of traffic and the speed of traffic being lower significantly increases the chance of uh, pedestrians surviving a crash and it significantly reduces the, the likelihood of a crash in the first place. So I think the, the road width should be our, our, you know, our number one priority all the way through and slowing the traffic down uh, and it should be 12 months a year. So uh, I, would, I would strongly advocate that we, we work with Fuss and O'Neill and, and whoever else we need to to figure that out. Uh, one additional point about the, the parking chaos that you described, I can't say that I've, I've experienced it firsthand. You give a vivid account, and I don't want to go look at it, but I believe you. And <laughs> I, I will say that um, uh, I know, well, over 20 years ago when that uh, parking lot was was expanded and redone, uh, we essentially handed out a, an invitation for free parking to uh, drivers, to kids, high school kids all across the city. 
And uh, as a result, it's no surprise, this has happened all over the world. When you have lots of free parking, people drive. And um, I know this firsthand because lots of people on my block, I live on Crescent Street, and uh, at school time, I see high schoolers get into their cars one at a time and drive off to the high school. It's only, it's, a, it's less than a mile away. It's a 15 minute walk. And yet the parking lot is being filled up by people from the neighborhood. Um, who don't? Who should not be driving? Some of them should, of course, if they have a broken leg or a disability or whatever. I get it, but the great majority of them don't. So I, I really hope that we can look at the the parking lot in a more holistic way than just facilitating the flow of the traffic, but also reducing the unnecessary traffic there. Yeah, a couple of comments. I mean, I actually did mention that to the school administrators. I mean, I'm from Boston, right? I went to Boston public schools, you know, Boston, I went to Boston Island High School and like we took a train to a bus and then we walked, you know, uphill, right? You know, the whole deal. Um, so I, I, I mean, we did have that conversation and that's, I think, a policy discussion um, for the high school to have around who's driving and who's not. Just a couple of comments around the separated bike lanes. Um, I do have on order um, a few of these um, sort of stanchions, these flexible stanchions that would provide a permanently separated bike lane. Um, I'm going to install them in my backyard here and like run them over with a plow um, and then run them over with a street sweeper. And I'm going to just try to beat on them and sort of see what type of a beating they can take. And from a maintenance standpoint, you know, what, what will happen to them. One of the things that Carolyn and I have discussed, um, and we can certainly discuss further, is an unmaintained bike lane in the winter, um, because I have no capability to clear snow out of a separated bike lane. I just do not have capability to do it. I also can't get my sweeping equipment into a separated bike lane. So if there is debris that gathers along the curve line that I geometrically cannot fit my equipment in to remove. Um, so we have to have the ability to deal with that. Um, so there's definitely a bunch of different ways we can come at this. I'm, I'm not sure how everyone would feel about an unmaintained bike lane in the winter, um, but we could just push the snow out of the travel lane. Um, and when it melts, it melts. Um, but again, we have a debris issue. So at some point I am going to have to get equipment in here to clean the debris uh, out of that gutter. Um, and, and that would be once the snow melts. Um, but I don't want to create a hazardous scenario. And this is the tension that we have um, in trying to design these projects. So just a, a couple of responses to, to your points. It would be okay if I followed up. Sure, go ahead. Um, thank you for that, Donna. And would you uh, be able to respond to my other point about, uh, and let me state it a different way, what um, has full consideration been given to uh, no bike lane, but uh, a narrower roadway? So, for example, just a 10-foot uh, lane width uh, from center to curb, so a 20-foot road width, and, uh, and, and share roads, so that there's no bike lane, there's no maintenance issue. And uh, I understand that uh, some people may feel, well, it's not safe for bicyclists and uh, Charlie Brown died there. I understand that, but a bike lane would not have saved his life. The, the traffic that killed him came from a side street through a, a stop sign. It would have happened with or without a bike lane. Um, whereas narrowing it down to 10 foot lanes will definitely slow down all the traffic. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we have to be careful of with this project, to answer your question, yes, we've, we've looked at a variety of different scenarios. Um, and one of the challenges we have at this project is funding it. Um, so where, you know, we're looking at the installation of traffic signals, um, which are sort of in and of themselves, very expensive and time consuming. Um, but when we start making significant alterations to the curb line, you are now impacting utilities. You're now impacting drainage, you're impacting um, the water and sewer in the area, which is quite old, by the way. So if we are going to start, you know, constructing a sidewalk, um, you know, on top of the roadway and moving that curb line, the price tag on this project starts to rise in a way 
where it, it can quickly become unaffordable. Um, so what we are trying to do is maintain the same roadway footprint, but rework it um, in a way that, that sort of fits within the community's vision, but also fits within our budget. So that's, I, I, I don't know if those are helpful comments, but that's just a... I think that the other piece that um, to follow up on that is the fact that um, without the curb line changing and just putting sharrows in, um, parents would still probably line up at least along the Elm Street Hill um, by the parking lot. And so that would um, not address that concern. And the, the, the goal is to keep all the people doing pickup inside the parking lot and not you know, con creating congestion on the surrounding streets with, the, with that. Um, I'll go to, and then just one other follow-up comment, James, to the, um, your comment, the other piece that's a policy issue about who gets parking spaces or parking passes in terms of high school students, I think there's also a relation to the fact that we charge for busing now. And so there's a disincentive to take the bus um, from that perspective. So that's another piece of the policy equation that would have to be considered. And that's outside of the infrastructure work that DPW is doing. So I'm gonna go to Devin first, cause she's on the committee and then Ben or anybody else on the committee first before we go to um, non-committee members. Go ahead, Devin. Yep, two quick thoughts. One is if we're charging for busing, I think it absolutely begs that we should be charging for parking. Uh, and my second comment is, um, I think it's very difficult to train behavior. Don, I've spent years trying to do it, I, I understand. But I did have some luck at the Survival Center by really talking to each person that was coming in. When we did curbside and we changed that whole pattern there, it, it, was, it was surprising to me that it did work and it really seems to. And I guess this is a captured group. It's the same people coming every day. So if they set their own expectations for how to behave, it, I, I'm I'm a little more positive than than it sounds from the school's point of view. But I would my my comment that I really wanted to make is I don't think it works to change things around. So once you get a pattern, it needs to stay that way all year long. Thanks. Yeah, I think I mean the school administration has been great. You know, they, I, I mean, they're certainly willing to entertain anything, but I will say it's very disheartened to see, you know, I had to pull those blocks for the winter on Route 9 and, you know, people were just queued there. I mean, there's no parking signs up there, you know, and like permanent no parking zone signs, you know, and every time I drive through there, there's people queued up there. And despite the engagement of the PTO and the school administration and actual signs, which say, do not stop your car here, um, you know, that's what's sort of making us really stop and, and kind of put the brakes on this um, from, from a safety standpoint. Um, great, thanks. Um, okay, Ben, you're up. Donna, thanks so much for all this work. I mean, this thing has been going going for a while with multiple iterations. Um, so first of all, I love the idea that you're uh, trying to destroy stanchions. That, that's just awesome. Um, I, I want to co-sign what James is saying about the need for a narrower road. And I really do think that, well, I will say that the concrete barriers as, as the bike separator has worked really, really well. Um, and so I'd like to see that remain and I think that the issue about uh, uh, whether it's snow removal or street sweeping or whatever is going to increase. And so that the answer long term, I know nobody wants to talk about budget, <laughs> but the long term answer is we're going to need that equipment. We've got separated bike lanes coming in on Main Street. We've got separated bike street, bike lanes already on King Street. Um, you know, this thing will be a separate, eventually the city's going to need the equipment to deal with its separated bike lanes. So I think given that we're talking about infrastructure and we're talking about stuff that's going to be there a while, it seems to me to make, to plan for the best infrastructure and then recognize that we have to have the budget for 
some equipment that's going to get used all around the city. Um, just because it, if we're lucky, <laughs> I think we're getting more of these bike lanes. Um, I definitely agree with everything people said about uh, the, um, the the paint is not a barrier, <laughs> and people people will will park on top of the paint. With regard to solving the traffic flow problem, um, so I think again, separated bike lanes down uh, down uh, Elm Street would be great and would help with dissuading people from queuing up up there because they might not be able to physically. Um, but we have the challenge inside the parking uh, area, aside from people parking who should probably be paying to park and that would make them choose something and changing the incentives and all that's policy. Again, longer term, I think the big problem is that bus circle and the fact that you not only have the bus circle, but you have the longer buses that can't fit around the bus circle. And I know we've talked about this one, or I shared with you an idea about this many years ago, but there used to be a straight shot one way for buses to drop off and pick up in front of the high school. And that was later turned into kind of a gravel grass area, but reopening that and actually making that a one way straight through only for buses would then allow you to have an entrance to the, the parking area and an exit in one, again, one way for people dropping students off. And that would allow you to have a rational uh, structure to how, how the, the tr traffic would go and gets the buses out of the way so that there's not that conflict at the bus circle. Yeah, I mean, that's actually part of the plan that that bus cut through. Um, and and I, I should have mentioned that. Um, in oh, my well, comments, that's great. But yeah, so that that bus cut through is actually going to be reopened just for buses. So the buses will be removed from the chaos. Um, there you go. But there, but there certainly is still enough chaos remaining um, oh, yeah. that it, that, you know, it requires a little further engineering and and just in terms of your comments about equipment the to maintain the bike lanes the purchase of the equipment is actually not the issue um it's the people to operate it that that's the that's the problem that's also a potentially ephemeral issue right we're in a particularly difficult time now um in terms of you know it's like it's it's hard to, to hire people that all those issues uh, CDL licenses, apparently the legalization of marijuana, marijuana is carrying, causing a problem, <laughs> um, is, but, yeah. but I feel like those are ephemeral problems, whereas infrastructure is less so. Thanks, Ben. Um, Jess? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Jess Levin. Um, I live over on Red Ave, and I, in my full-time job, work for the Massachusetts Bicycle Coalition. Um, studies have shown time and time again that paint actually does not improve um, anything for bicyclists. Uh, we see all down Elm Street, cars will, if there's a car turning left, people will come right into the bike lane. I saw someone almost get hit the other day um because they just popped into that painted bike lane um a little bit before the uh high school area that we're discussing right now so i'm in strong support for protected bike lane and want to kind of co-sign ben's point in terms of maintenance um equipment i know it is uh, an issue in who will drive it um but i lived in a city once where they had a very small little sweet sleep sweet street sweeper and plow and actually the bike lanes and the trails were almost more accessible because they got plowed sooner um potentially this is also an opportunity to work with friends of northampton trails along with like the clearing of the trails if we're going to be thinking about our on-street network as well um i know that doesn't go all the way up to the high school um and then another point i would like to bring up is um massive safe routes to schools funding 
is now available for high school students. It wasn't previously, but Massachusetts Safe Routes to Schools does offer free bicycle and pedestrian education for high schoolers now. I know that there are some teachers who are helping with some bike to school day stuff next week. Um, but if that's something that could be brought up potentially with the administration about teaching the students using that funding pot, why it is advantageous to bike and walk to school to kind of get some of those people out of their cars. Um, that might be uh, potentially useful. <laughs> thanks, Jess. Great, thanks. Um, go ahead, Claudia. I, sorry, I have a quick question. Is the lane, the biking lane to discourage traffic or to make biking safer for kids that bike to school or through traffickers up Elm Stream? Like, will it go street, will it go all the way down to South Street? I mean, I'm sorry, I, I'm behind, just quickly. Do you wanna take that, Donna? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're doing some work directly in front of the high school. We're installing um, traffic signals at the intersection of Elm and North Elm, so Route 9 um, and where it turns into Elm Street, and then Route 9 and Woodlawn. So that's sort of the project area is, is just that very limited area. So um, anytime we're working in an area, we want to improve it to the best of our ability. So we want to install some level of, of bicycle facilities, improve the pedestrian facilities, narrow the roadway, um, and then implement the traffic signals. So it's just that particular area. This is not a corridor project. This is a very confined area. Okay, But it connects with the existing um, paint it on street bike lanes right. and will add um, separated, potentially separated facilities along uh, North Elm down the hill towards Bay State. Um, okay. So, yeah. Carolyn, um, going down the hill, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good pitch. And I'm there all the time on my bike. And usually um, when I come down the hill past the high school, I'm taking a left on Riverside. And uh, I just um, wanna suggest that we consider protected bike lane up the hill, but maybe not down the hill. Why? Be well, it's common practice to consider that on, on steep hills that you do a bike lane on the uphill where a bicyclist is going much slower and they spend a lot more time and they they have a much higher differential between their speed and the, and the car speed going down the hill the cyclists are going essentially the same speed as the cars uh and if you combine that then with a lot of traffic at least in my case taking a left turn we're going to have to think carefully how are you going to get out of a fast downhill bike lane on the right side uh to, to, to make a left turn at the bottom there yeah i mean i guess i would to that point i would say well, um, the other concern is to pr prevent parents from parking on that side of the road too. So by narrowing it with a separated bike lane, it slows obviously the traffic, but also prevents that parking on that side. Um, and of course you can always opt not to use the bike lane to make that left turn. The other piece that reminds me that maybe some folks aren't aware of, but uh, you probably are James is, the um, geometry changes at Milton and Riverside. So instead of having those two streets coming in right there at North Elm, there'll be a right angle. Uh, Milton will be redesigned to intersect with Riverside and then Riverside to um, as a, at a right angle. So yeah, I mean, that we actually we looked at putting a roundabout in there, and um, we we can't fit it. it doesn't fit. It's a problem with roundabouts. Like they're a great idea. Like they just don't fit anywhere, you know? You just need a smaller one. I guess. Uh, it's fine. Like if no one drove a truck, you know, but. <laughs> um, okay. Any other comments on the high school project before we move on? Okay. Thanks. Um, do you have any other updates, Donna? 
Um, I, nothing other than to just comment um, that we are going to be doing uh, drainage work on the bike path at Adair Place. Um, that's something that has to get done before we actually do our, our bike path resurfacing project. Um, so that's going to get going here shortly. We do have a preliminary estimate on the bike path. So we're going to pave from uh, Stop and Shop up to Look Park. Um, and that estimate is higher than we want it to be. Um, so we're just doing a little work to understand um, what that means. We're also waiting on a potential mass trails grant that's that's going to come through here shortly in the next um, uh 30 to 60 days i think what when does that come through carolyn maybe um probably june yeah um so we'll know if we have that grant or not and that that'll make a difference um if we do um so other than that the the paving projects uh paving and sidewalk work that i've previously announced um we'll be getting going we just uh about to sign a contract um so 2.4 almost 2.5 million dollars worth of uh paving and sidewalks um uh, planned for for the summer so that's about to get rolling that's all i got okay thanks um so just um updates from our department we're actually i'm working with donna with um we're trying to get the contract out to finally install the bike shelter storage in pulaski park so again that's a <laughs> that's a person power issue but um um, hopefully we can get that contracted um, before the summer really launches. Um, can you just remind us, Carolyn, how uh, those will be allotted? Who will get to use those? Anybody. And <laughs> on a one-off date. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and They're you, not going to be pass or Bring your own, bring yeah. your own mm -hmm. It's just going to be covered. Um, we'll have to put the, um, it did not come with bike loops. It's just the shelter. Oh, we'll it's not. We're in. not talking about the old shelter, the old bins that had a closing door. No, 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 no. It's just a yeah. It's just the shelter right. piece. So, go ahead. Can we do an opening ceremony for it? <laughs> installed. Um, sure. Great. <laughs> I volunteered. Okay. I'll plan it. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Jess. <laughs> I'm gonna write that down right I here. Will. It's going in the minute. Yes, I've, I've set <laughs> it on the recording. <laughs> Okay, um, that means we're on the hook to get it done. <laughs> okay, um, so the only, you probably all saw the announcement that we have hired Drop Mobility to run the regional bike share. So we've started, they've started working already. They've done some evaluation of the bikes in, that have been in storage for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. This week, their plan um, was starting today. And I don't know if they're going to get to it, but they were going to go around and um, check, start checking stations to make sure the stations are up and running. Um, so they're moving, you know, at a pretty good clip to um, get that going. We don't have a start date, of course, yet, but you'll, we, you know, it'd be great to um, send out and help if you guys could help send the word once we have the membership and the, and the web um, interface set up for people to join and um, sign up for memberships. Um, that would be great to have support here from this group to do that. Can you do the ribbon cutting? Kind of yeah, <laughs> I'll help do a launch. Okay. I think we should do a relaunch party. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to say that I know that um, I used to work in Bike Share and Drop was working in Kansas City and I only heard good things about them. So I hope that they do good things here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to help do something nice, big, and because people have been asking. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Um, let's see, we'll check here. Carolyn, will you send out something that you want us to then forward around? Yes, absolutely. Yep. Um, okay. Um, so the only other thing, um, whoops, I'll go back to Zoom. Um, I don't, we'll probably have something more um, maybe in the next week or so once they have a better idea of um, what the situation is, um, more data about the bikes and the stations. Um, 
So we're still waiting on um, just an update on Picture Main Street. We're going to have a review with MassDOT later this week. And um, at that point, at some point soon, then I think MassDOT will release the 75% plans. We've gotten through the ENF process for that. So it's make it's marching its way through. Um, so that's just a quick update there. Um, there was, and then the other th the thing that I have on the agenda uh, was that the last meeting, I think Benjamin Spencer asked about the equipment in the parking garage and whether that could be used for um, clearing um, bike lanes and sidewalks outside of downtown. Um, I haven't checked that equipment was purchased particularly for the downtown street. So I just wanted to close that loop on the comment that came in last week. I don't think Benjamin is online, um, but at any rate, just wanted to um, circle back on that because there was a request about that equipment. And so the answer is no, it cannot be used outside of downtown. Um, I Well, I think it's a matter of capacity, like it's just two, one or two pieces of equipment. And so it's, you, it was, they were purchased for maintaining the downtown streets. So, um, and, um, let's see, just checking, um, okay. Oh, I guess, um, I'll probably cede the um, floor to Jess, but I just wanted everyone probably knows that next week is our bike breakfast week and bike party stuff. And since we have experts in the room that are not myself, I can certainly, if you want to make that announcement about bike week, that would be great. <laughs> So I've been working with George Kohau and Carl, um, who is someone who works at Smith, and we've been really hitting the pavement for Bike to Work Week. We have a full week of events. Um, there is a bike repair clinic at Forbes Library on the 14th. I did a bike commuter workshop at Forbes a couple of weeks back to try to get people going. Our 25th annual bike breakfast is going to be Wednesday, May 15th at Pulaski Park. Um, uh, I talked to the Pioneer Valley Transit um, and they're going to bring a practice bus bike rack and have a bus driver on hand so people can practice putting their bikes on the bus. We're going to have food. We're gonna have people tabling. It's gonna be so much fun. <laughs> Friends of Northampton Trails is doing their monthly bike party ride on Thursday. And we also got progression to agree to an after party after the bike ride where there's gonna be half off apps. Um, there's gonna be a bike commuter happy hour on the Friday at Northampton Bicycles Little Bar. They're gonna have cocktails and mocktails for purchase that are bike themed. Um, and then Sanctuary Yoga in Thorns is going to be doing a free bike yoga session on the Saturday at noon. And then it all ends with the Great Tree Bike Ride that All Ed Adventures and All Bodies on Bikes, Western Mass, and Friends of Northampton Trail are working on together. Um, and the self-guided version of that, which some of you might be familiar with, is happening from the 11th through the 19th. So you can go look at the Great Trees. And FNT has their map that they have online um, and printed. And the most exciting thing is me and George and Carl have been going to all the businesses downtown. And we have 12 businesses on board that are going to give discounts to bicyclists who bike and show their helmet um, between the 13th and the 19th. Um, so the full list of all that is going to be on nohobikeweek.com. But um, yeah, we have some exciting discounts um, and we're hoping that that will uh, help support the business community on Main Street and show that bicyclists do a uh, bike downtown. Um, and that's Bike Dark Week. Thanks. Um, all right. Any other comments before we do minutes? From anybody? Uh, okay. Yes, I, I just wanted to add something to what Jess said <clears throat> about uh, bicycle breakfast, which is that 
a lot of the food or almost all, or, or all of the food and supplies are prov being provided by local businesses. So mm -hmm. we'll have a list about that. We're working on that right now and we'll have a list available about that as well. So it's a, just an important thing to note. The community is going to be supporting this as they have in the past. Great. Right. Thanks, Freeman. Um, I had one comment that I just wanted to um, relay. This is on behalf of Deb Henson, who was going to come here. She wanted to raise a concern about one of her friends who was injured on the shared use path, bike path, um, as a pedestrian. She was hit by a cyclist. So she wanted to just put out put that out there and ask if there were any, you know, modifications or things that could be done to improve safety. And of course, and I explained that um, actually FNT is um, has a sign program and we'll be doing rotating signs that remind people about notif you know, announcing to pass and what this um, appropriate uh, speeds are for cyclists and also to mind for people to mind each other when they're when they're on the path. Um, Do we know any details at all about what happened, what the circumstances were? No, I mean, okay. she was gonna come and describe it and um, so. That, yeah. that would help a lot as a, both a pedestrian and a cyclist on the path. I mean, I'm both all the time and I yeah. see, I see um, silly behaviors, dangerous behaviors on the part of both parties frequently. Right. Yeah. Um, Carolyn, Devin here. Um, Simone, I'm going to recognize you. You had your hand up. Would you want to visit the last topic? Okay, then I had a comment about this one. If the one concern I have is that it is so completely easy to override the limiters on e-bikes and it's almost designed to be overridden. It takes it takes a pocket knife. So, um if the bike that is involved in an in you know, in hitting a pedestrian can be identified. That's one thing I would want the police to have some concept of looking at, or maybe just the EMTs, but it, I'd like for the knowledge about that override to get out. Ben? Um, well, so I, I ride that, those trails all the time and I'm mostly on there as a cyclist. So at the risk of sounding like an like a car driver who blames the cyclists that they hit, um, uh, <laughs> uh, people don't seem to realize that it's a that is a travel way with two way traffic. Um, and the other thing is, uh, and I don't know how to solve this, but when you say passing on your left and then they step to their left. <laughs> Um, which seems which happens a lot. Um, now I've never hit anyone, but I have chosen to drive off or you know to ride my bike off the trail entirely into the bushes or whatever um, because of those kinds of things. Um, I've actually twice had to deliberately take a spill on my bike in order to avoid hitting somebody who stepped in the wrong directions. Like the announce to pass doesn't work if people can't think it through. Um, and some, especially, I have to say, young people, like uh, coming out after after junior high schools, it lets out, they walk four or five, seven abreast, and no amount of announcing whether you're coming on or otherwise gets them to change. So, I mean, I don't know the answer. I think that center line and something that, kind of makes it really explicit this is a travel way with two-way traffic might help at least for those who th think like drivers <laughs> but um yeah it's it's a real problem I, I don't know how to solve it I would like to say that the, those that signs that FNT has printed will be installed probably the third week of this month so uh, you know, we're getting close to to placing them. We haven't figured out exactly how we're going to move them to different locations because because that was the additional plan. But we are working on that, and not that that's uh, going to change people's behavior terribly well, but at least it's a step in that direction. Thanks. Okay. Um, 
Can I get a motion on the minutes from April? Was that when it was? April 10th? I move to accept the, the minutes. Devin seconds. Thank you. I'll do a roll call. Uh, Freeman? Yes. Um, Donna? Yes. Um, Brett? Yes. Didn't see you pop in. Hi. <laughs> um, and James? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Okay. So that's it. That's all I have, unless anybody has any final comments. Okay. Great. Thanks, everyone.